I'm going to talk to you a little bit about diversity loss from a genetics perspective. And I think this is really fitting because yesterday, if you, any of you were on social media, which I think pretty much everyone is now, yesterday was Endangered Species Day and there were some great conversations going on about which of our species are most at risk and what we can do about it in the future. And you might be asking yourself, what does improving a Siberian tiger's dating profile have to do with diversity loss? We're losing global diversity. And often when we think about losing this global diversity, we talk about statistics at the broad level. So we say we're losing 200 species a day, or we've lost X number of total species. But for the populations that are still persisting, the more important questions lie at the individual and population losses. So individuals are made up of a unique set of genes, just like you or I are. And often moving into this more human-dominated landscape, the populations that we have are shrinking, so they're made up of fewer individuals. And in addition, there are local extinctions of these populations. So if any given species were decreasing the amount of unique genetic variation that that species then has to adapt and survive in the future. And tigers are no stranger to diversity loss. As one of the most charismatic megafauna, they've been hit particularly hard with species losses in the last several hundred years. By 1970, tigers had a little bit less than 40% of what we estimate to be their historic habitat remaining, and a little less than 40,000 individuals in the wild. By 2010, those numbers had dropped to less than 10% of their habitat remaining, and less than 5,000 individuals. But this is just looking at the broad level. So this is talking about tigers as a whole. But what about all of the unique populations that exist and make up the parts of tigers? So there have been these local extinctions. In the 1940s, tigers went extinct in Bali. In the 1970s, they went extinct in Central Asia. In the 1980s, they went extinct in Java. And in the 1990s, they went extinct in South China. And every time we've lost one of those populations and we've shrunk our remaining ones, we're reducing that genetic diversity that makes tigers so unique, that will give them the best chance of surviving in the future. And if we look at this from a geographic perspective, you can see tigers' present range here in green on the screen, with human population density mapped in blue, with a, more, a darker blue color, meaning higher human population density levels. Human population growth is only going to increase. This is something that we've all accepted. And so as human population densities increase, we're only going to continue to fragment the populations that remain for tigers. And what we've seen so far when we've looked at a genetic level is that for many of these species that have shrunk in these ways, most of the, for, for tigers, most subspecies have very little diversity. So in this graph here on the left, you can see a representation of what we found when we looked at just a part of the tiger genome. So this is just a small part, the mitochondrial uh, genome. And when there are, is, when, in the places that there are one dot, that means that every time we looked at an individual in that locality, when we looked at the genetic level, these individuals were identical. Of course, this is only a small peek into what's going on at the genome, at the, at genome wide, but this still does not bode well for tigers. So for Siberian tigers and for Indochinese tigers, we found no variation, a little bit more in Sumatrans and Malayans, and more in Bengals. But we know that in India, for Bengal tigers, many of these populations are extremely fragmented. Many that you see on this, represented on the screen by these dots are now extinct, and they're not continuous anymore. Gene flow cannot occur between the two of them. So if genetic diversity will ensure an adequate toolkit for the future, how do we ensure that tigers are retaining that diversity? How do we deal with the fact that we're going to be facing many small populations in the future? And first, let me just convince you that genetic diversity is important and why we should be considering it and bringing it in, in, into part of the conversation about biodiversity loss. So here is a white tiger. White tigers occur naturally in the wild. It's a genetic variant that causes this white phenotype, except for it's extraordinarily rare and only occurs in Bengal tigers in India. However, these tigers are beautiful, and people wanted more of them. So what they did was that they began to breed very closely related individuals together to give themselves the best chance of getting another white tiger. And this is what we call inbreeding, when you breed very closely related individuals together. 
But what we, what we begin to see is that when you breed very closely related individuals together and you homogenize that diversity at the genomic level, you begin to see other side effects, like this tiger here, which has crossed eyes, and other health problems which we've seen also in human populations. You may also be familiar with the story of the Florida panther. In the early 1990s, the Florida panther only had eight females left in the population. In addition to there only being eight females left, the males were showing very strong signs of being completely sterile. So for a population that's already struggling, this is an additional problem that they're having to deal with. What the managers decided to do was bring other individuals from a unique population of panthers in Texas in order to genetically rescue. And these individuals, this population, was able to rebound but still faces extreme challenges in overcoming these human influences. And furthermore, what we found so far when we look at the genome is when you homogenize areas that are very important for survival, so areas like immune regions, regions that are responsible for these responses to, to viruses and to other outbreaks, like in the lions of the Serengeti and the Nagorogoro crater, they've been hit several times by something called canine distemper, which is an outbreak, a viral outbreak, that causes encephalitis and eventually death for many lions. And we know that for species that have little diversity at these very important genome regions, that they are not able to respond to this as well as they would be if they had genetic diversity in those areas. And you might have also heard about the Tasmanian devil, so this is a very recent example of this. There's a transmissible cancer that is blasting through this population. We think that several individuals have developed resistance, but I wouldn't want to take my bets on increasingly smaller smaller populations that just one individual, one or two individuals, will hold the key to that resistance. So how do we rescue tiger diversity? How do we, how do we face these challenges moving into the future? So if we think about the timelines of tigers over evolutionary history, initially tigers were well admixed. When they first evolved, they were probably all kind of in one place, and the gene flow was pretty good between them. They then evolved over very long periods of time into the five subspecies that we know today, which are genetically and geographically extinct and can be seen listed here. Independently, all of these subspecies are or may be headed for extinction. Either way, they're in trouble. So one idea is that we can merge them. So similar to what the Florida panther story told us, we can take genes from other populations to sort of recover the diversity. And then we can recover them independently in their different geographic locations. But this is a complicated question. How many individuals do we move? How often do we move them? Which individuals are the most fit that we should be introducing genes of them into the new populations? And the other problem that I've only barely touched on is these increasing human impacts that we're facing. So more cap tigers exist in captivity in the wild, which is an astounding statistic. In the US alone, there are between five and 10,000 tigers that are in non-accredited zoos and sanctuaries. So these are not managed breeding plans, like when you go to the San Francisco Zoo or the Oakland Zoo and you see tigers. These are tigers that exist, people breed for profit, for cub petting and for trade into the illegal wildlife trade. And we don't know anything about these populations. But what our lab does is we try and use genomic tools to better understand what diversity we have and what diversity we might be able to use to give species the best chance that they have, they can in the future. So in this plot here, on the left side, you can see what a genomic signal looks like from one of the wild subspecies of tigers. So they're pure individuals, or what we would call pure individuals. And when we looked at the genomic level of the captive populations, what we found is that they actually are mixed. So their ancestry shows up genetically as being from mixed between all of these different unique subspecies. So this is the experiment that I detailed on the previous slide kind of happening in real time. So this will give us a good idea of what we are looking at moving into the future. And furthermore, we've also found that tigers in captivity, because these populations were seeded before many the large bottlenecks occurred in the wild, actually have relictual diversity or ancestral diversity. So diversity that is now extinct in the wild, we still have in captive populations. So they may be key moving forward. So I'll ask you again, should Siberian tigers seek exotic mates? This is a complicated question. There is no straightforward answer. 
But we must consider all of our options facing the critical losses in biodiversity that we are experiencing, these shrinking population sizes. We need more information on what we have and ways to preserve this diversity long term. And genomic sequencing of not only us, but of non-model organisms such as the tiger can help us to make these decisions. And some of these decisions may include migration and translocations between current populations or establishment of new ones. So if we think back to the first slide that I showed, we often think of biodiversity loss at the larger levels over very long periods of time. But remember that we need to think of it also at smaller levels so that we give the species that are remaining the best possible chance of survival and enhance their genetic toolkits into the future. I'd like to thank all of my funders as well as my labs and to you for listening. Thank you.